topic for the next few minutes is uh, the future of uh, cancer care through biologic profiling and big data. And uh, before getting started into the particulars of this subject, I want to tell you why as a medical oncologist, I know that there's one other medical oncologist in the audience, Dr. Steve O'Day is in the back there, there may be others, but this is really uh, one of the most exciting times, uh, not only in the history of cancer medicine, but in the history of medicine. And the way I like to describe it uh, is when I was a fellow in medical oncology in the mid-1980s, not so long ago, uh, we thought very much in terms of the organ site of origin, whether a patient had newly diagnosed disease or whether they had advanced disease. And the fact of the matter is that even in 2017, we're somewhat tied to that construct, but increasingly we think of that as being an antiquated way of thinking. Why? Because we understand that um, one person with colon cancer might have biological characteristics to their tumor, uh, not to mention to themselves, that are more like those of someone else with lung cancer or breast cancer. And uh, we're increasingly less concerned, certainly those of us who are caring for patients with metastatic disease, with advanced disease, we're less concerned with the organ site of origin and more concerned with the driving biological characteristics of that individual's tumor. Uh, that's, uh, that's the one point. The other uh, Lee and others in this audience are renowned for, and that is that basically Mike alluded to this, we're, we're really redefining what it means to be ill. And for cancer specialists, that means anticipating the cancer, ideally, to identifying uh, risk, both on a population level and also at the individual level. So it's those two currents, uh, the concept of unique biological characteristics and the concept of illness really being the definition of risk of uh, active disease that is really transforming in a very important way the way we practice uh, medicine. Uh, my disclosures, uh, as um, Nathan alluded to, we're all part of certainly ISB and the Swedish Cancer Institute, Swedish medical system. We're uh, members of the larger Providence St. Joseph Health family. I thought I'd tell you very quickly a little bit about um, the, the practice that, that I work in, the Cancer Institute, as well as our broader system family. And there are folks here today from the broad Providence St. Joseph Health system. Uh, we're a 50 hospital system spanning seven states. It's a not-for-profit health system, but with many unique units. Uh, ISB, one of the more recent, uh, recently inducted members. Uh, the Swedish uh, health system is a not-for-profit secular health system within the larger uh, Catholic uh, health system. To give you some idea, and we're talking big data, and one of the reasons we're trying to organize common platforms across our own system is that together across Providence St. Joseph Health, we care for over 41,000 new patients every year diagnosed with cancer. 41,000 newly diagnosed patients with cancer every year just within our system. Now, um, I was uh, at AACR just uh, 24 hours ago, and I was approached by someone uh, from another country, and they uh, j really were very excited and wanted to know where exactly in Stockholm was the Swedish Cancer Institute located. <laughs> and I uh, politely explained that, uh, much to their chagrin, that we're actually on First Hill, not sure they knew where that was, in uh, Seattle. Uh, the Swedish Cancer Institute is actually an interesting organization. The Swedish Health System was founded in 1910, and the Swedish Cancer Institute, in turn, was founded in 1932. So it's actually one of the oldest cancer institutes in the country and uh, actually had the first uh, radiation therapy practice west of the Mississippi in 1932. Now, mission vision statements are a dime a dozen, as the saying goes. When we formulated this in our strategic planning process in 2013, we focused on survival, the quality of life, prevention, eliminating cancer through innovation, but in particular, this, this concept of uh, each individual effectively having unique clinical and biological characteristics. And again, that's one of the driving principles, of course, of personalized medicine. I'll come back to that. Uh, we have been uh, very active in the domain of therapeutic development. 
uh, which increasingly is being driven by biologic profiling, and I'll come back to that point as well. Uh, this, I just thought for fun, I'd show you. This is the machine that was turned on in 1932. Looks like something from those old Saturday night Frankenstein movies, but um, it was an orthovoltage machine back in the day. Now, we are organized. You know, I've just given you a very uh, lucid argument for why we shouldn't pay attention to organ sites of origin, and yet that's how we're organized. Uh, we have nine multidisciplinary disease sites, GI, GU, thoracic, and uh, those are the organizing principles, as they are in most academic centers, for our clinical work as well as our clinical and translational research. So each of those disease sites has a respective clinical and research agenda. Within the Cancer Institute, the Swedish Cancer Institute, we see approximately 8,000 uh, new cancer patients a year, and roughly 10% of that total is, uh, of patients are accrued to uh, clinical trials, which underscores the challenge that we have across the nation in terms of engaging folks, individuals, in uh, clinical trial participation, why Lars' uh, presentation was so important. So back in 2013, we began our strategic planning process, and we wanted to focus on the concept of personalized medicine with a double meaning. On the one hand, holistic care. We have a very uh, robust set of supportive care services, survivorship, palliative care, uh, psycho-oncology, oncophysiatry, integrative medicine, genetic counseling, I can go on. And then the other, of course, is what we've already alluded to, uh, utilizing the molecular, that is gene, protein, and epigenetic information from the patient or their tumor to address the entire spectrum of uh, the cancer experience, if I could use that term. And this slide emphasizes that, that indeed, what we wish to do is not just focus on choosing uh, the, the therapy du jour for the person who you're caring for, but thinking of the entire patient care experience in terms of risk assessment, uh, prevention, early diagnosis, as well as survivorship. And we aspire to do this again through the construct of our nine multidisciplinary teams. So that's a, a quick descriptor. I want to start by describing the, the method by which we step-by-step step assembled our personalized medicine program. So uh, like so many things, uh, the, the field is uncertain. Um, it's difficult to get started sometimes because one is always seeking perfection, but it was key not to let perfection be the enemy of progress. We started with some basic uh, concepts. One is that, and I know Lee uh, has reminded me repeatedly that he doesn't care for this, but we went small with targeted sequencing and uh, not only of particular actionable genes based on the evidence, but uh, the regions of those genes. And we decided that because of the clinical realm in which we were working. We can come back to that. The other guiding principle was we felt very strongly that we wanted to do this at the earliest point in the patient's clinical trajectory. This is something that Lee would applaud. Uh, because what we wanted to do is to identify that molecular fingerprint, if I can use that term, of the patient's tumor as early in the course of their illness, and then to effectively use that information as much as possible to inform the management of the patient. Not only whether something is done, but in some cases whether something is not done, which is an important point in medicine. And then the third item was effectively to say, well, my goodness, um, clinicians are using this type of information in many different ways. It's hard to prescribe to them what exactly they should do. So we begin with the principle that we would observe how the testing was used, and we would analyze how the testing was used. And how do you do that? You do that through an IRB-approved registry protocol. So basically, in uh, 2014, in the spring, we launched our targeted uh, sequencing panel, basically performed on paraffin-embedded tissue and uh, using a, a MySeq uh, platform, NGS, uh, Next Generation Sequencing Technology. And Dr. Anna Berry is in the back of the room here. She is our scientific director and can speak to the details of that approach. Then in the fall, we 
activated our registration trial. We've now accrued almost 1,000 patients on that trial. And uh, importantly, in January of 2015, we began a molecular tumor board. And I'll talk a little bit more about the importance of this as both a management tool and an education tool. And when, it, when I say education, uh, although most physicians don't think they need any more education, I'm talking about educating the clinicians who are trying to use this information on behalf of their patients. And then uh, in 2015, in November, late that year, we were one of the early adopters, not of Synapse, Laura, but of Psyaps, uh, Synapse without the N, which again is another cloud-based platform that effectively bolts on to the electronic medical record and allows us to collect, organize, and analyze the molecular phenotypic data in the context of the clinical information that is in EPIC. And uh, that's an important work in progress. Uh, lastly, as a phase one investigator, which I am, uh, the uh, fifth and final piece of this program is our innovative therapeutics unit that we inaugurated last uh, spring of 2016. And is effectively a state-of-the-art phase one unit that's focused on the administration of early phase uh, targeted therapies that are informed by the biologic profiling. So I'm going to run through a few slides very quickly. I just want to give you a flavor of the overall approach, and then we'll end by talking about the data aspects to include the direction of big data that my uh, title alludes to. First of all, the eligibility criteria for uh, this registration trial that I've referenced is really anyone with active malignancy or even pre-malignant conditions. We focused our program on adults, and of course, patients who, in theory, would be candidates for systemic therapy and who have a survival of at least uh, several months. Not always known to the clinician, as the clinicians in the audience know. Uh, the exclusion criteria, again, uh, just the inability to understand and give consent for the registry trial and patients who have inadequate uh, tissue specimens for uh, sequencing. Now, uh, to date, as I referenced, we're close to 1,000 patients being recruited. I want to show one aspect uh, of this slide that's important. For a while, uh, we had not done this early on, and we soon recognized that we were not giving access to all of our patients to participate on this trial. The concepts of genomics, as we all know, in the clinical setting are, are complex, and to uh, to communicate those and to engage patients, not only in a culturally competent way, but in a language uh, that is appropriate, we prospectively uh, translated our consent form in seven languages that represented the common languages beyond English that are used by our patient population. It's made a big difference in engaging our patients. The other thing that we do that's very important, and think of this, in the olden days, like five or 10 years ago, uh, a pathology report was really a static report. Adenocarcinoma of the colon, uh, maybe by then uh, a comment on KRAS, maybe not, uh, but really a rather static document. Nowadays, the pathology report that includes molecular phenotypic information is dynamic. The report can be the same in terms of the molecular uh, phenotype, but maybe three, six months down the road, the interpretation, the evidence base for interpreting that phenotype may have changed considerably. So that we have an approach of, at least on an annual basis, and certainly every time the patient experiences a clinical change, progression of disease, toxicity, we reevaluate or at least ask the provider if they would like to revisit uh, the evidence base. We're also anticipating, of course, that with technologies like liquid biopsy, uh, in particular, that patients will have longitudinal sampling and reassessment, and obviously Mike's presentation alludes to this in, in the general population, the longitudinal uh, monitoring of, of patients in terms of biologic parameters. Now, in many ways, are there, there, there certainly are some IT experts in the audience. For most folks, when they see this slide, their oxygen level goes down. Um, <laughs> But for IT specialists, when they look at this slide, they get really excited. 
So try to channel that excitement. This is indeed one of the strengths of the platform that we've assembled both at the SCI and now throughout Providence St. Joseph Health. This is effectively what I was describing before. We have the electronic uh, medical record uh, that in, in large part channels through an enterprise data warehouse that is the common ground for the different iterations of our electronic medical record, which happens to be EPIC. If you've seen one instance of EPIC, or uh, you've seen one instance of EPIC, right? And uh, basically, I can tell there's some experienced folks in the audience. So the point is that through the Enterprise Data Warehouse, we effectively arrive at a common language, and uh, then SIAPS, that cloud-based platform, interacts with the Enterprise Data Warehouse. Again, the combination of the molecular phenotypic and the clinical information. What makes this platform even more powerful, we have the input from our sequencing labs. So Dr. Uh, Barry at Cellnetics uh, basically uh, does the sequencing in-house for the SCI, and that gets communicated into the platform. But we also have uh, input, evidence-based input. We have a partner, N of One, who helps us uh, provide current, up-to-date, evidence-based uh, information, uh, not only for the medical literature, but in terms of uh, available clinical trials. We have a very important uh, connection to our system-wide clinical trials management system, which happens to be VELOS. And I want to mention Dr. Melody Kraft, who's here, who leads our research efforts in terms of research administration across the system. And this was an early strategy that we adopted across all of Providence St. Joseph Health to strive for a common CTMS. Uh, we have uh, done a lot of work with synoptic pathology. And the other item that's critically important is the tumor registry. Not only our local disease site registries, but the tumor registry, which has the cleanest data from an outcomes uh, uh, standpoint. So it's this integrated platform uh, that provides the robust support for this uh, program. Uh, this is an example as of October of last year of the uh, sequencing results on our broad population of patients. Uh, this is actually, uh, these are some screenshots from SIAPS just to give you an idea of what this looks like. This is now embedded in our uh, medical record here at the Swedish Cancer Institute, and this is being done across the system, so that when the clinician goes into the EMR, he or she has immediate access to the genomic information. This gives you the usual uh, clinical data on the patient, past treatments, um, as well as uh, laboratory information. And then importantly, uh, the um, gene alterations that are found in that patient's tumor, the on-label or off-label or clinical trial-driven uh, therapies that might be appropriate for uh, that gene alteration or the cluster of gene alterations that the patient has. Uh, and again, this is a listing of on-label, off-label, and the clinical trials, as I mentioned. Our iteration of this IT platform has a sophisticated clinical trials matching algorithm. And uh, that sounds like a, a simple task, but indeed it's a rather complex one. This is interesting and it relates a lot to the previous two talks. This is something that the clinicians can do at their laptop, basically to look for patients like theirs. And uh, obviously you wanna be cautious with that. That's similar to what we used to say years ago, not wanting to treat the patient in front of you based on the last abstract that you had read. You don't want to treat the patient uh, in front of you based on a small amount of clinical information, but as the end grows, this type of uh, dynamic real-time data mining will truly inform the way we manage patients. So, um, I want to tell you a little bit about the Molecular Tumor Board. Again, Anna, who's in the back of the room, is our leader for this effort. And it really is like uh, an older day, disease-oriented multidisciplinary conference, except that the focus is on the gene alteration profile. Uh, we give the history of the patient. We show light microscopy. At this point, we don't show radiographic films. We may change that. I actually felt strongly that we should show the light microscopy. And then what do we do? We focus on the recognized gene alterations. By the way, I would 
mention that this is a real life uh, presentation that occurred in uh, March of two, 2017, so not too long ago. And this is a patient with, I won't go into the details, but they have a sigmoid nodule that uh, was the reference specimen. We have the gene alterations and then the relevant pathways. And I like to say to uh, young physicians and to lay audiences that in many ways, uh, the modern day CAT scan is basically this mechanistic pathway. So that increasingly medical oncologists will think of their patients when they think of the molecular biology in the context of the relevant pathways. So it's with this information, looking at the relevant pathways in this case, that the on and off-label therapies are shown, as well as one therapy that's available through a current basket trial, which provides the drugs free of charge to the patient, and other clinical trials that are relevant. And these are ordered, prioritized, we're working on this algorithm, but prioritized in terms of relevance to the patient uh, from a medical standpoint, as well as um, factoring in things like geography, proximity to the clinical trial. Now this slide is to remind me that what is wrong with this picture? This is uh, a slide I put together last fall and it hasn't changed all that much. These are the 17 drugs to my left that are currently approved by the FDA with a companion biomarker. So the point is we have 17 drugs that have been FDA approved with a companion, in most cases, gene alteration that relates to therapy. We're at the very early point in this field is the message. Now, um, we're taking this program in part from the experience that we've had here in Seattle at the uh, Swedish Cancer Institute, but also taking in experiences from other corners of our uh, greater system to include our Portland colleagues, uh, Walter, ba, um, Carlo Bofulco and, and company, and putting together a system-wide program that again is intended to deliver access to all of our patients across the broader Providence St. Joseph Health System. We have a working committee, again, Walter and I are the co-chairs, but the heavy lifting is done by the respective working group uh, co-chairs, uh, covering everything from bioinformatics, registry repository, laboratory specifications, clinical applications, research, and indeed the business aspects. Uh, we've launched a 300 gene alteration panel, initially through the lab in Portland. We're about to segue to that larger panel in uh, a couple months. And uh, increasingly in uh, medical oncology, folks are primarily for reimbursement reasons, but some for uh, programmatic uh, reasons that make sense from a clinical standpoint, are starting to focus on, say, colon, lung, or breast panels. Uh, but there is virtue in looking at the broader set of uh, biologic characteristics, uh, because occasionally, as I mentioned before, these gene alterations cross uh, disease site lines in the conventional sense. Um, again, uh, we, I've, I've mentioned that we've launched the, um, the panel in Portland and are soon to launch it here in Seattle. And the two sequencing centers will be servicing the entire uh, system as we now see it. Now, what we're also doing, I wanted to emphasize with this slide, we're going to expand access throughout that 50 hospital system that I showed you. And indeed, uh, by 2018, 2019, we aspire to do broader biologic profiling. Bi biologic profiling that will include not only a whole exome or whole genome uh, sequencing, but also some degree of transcriptomics, proteomics, microbiomics, and immune profiling. And indeed, this platform is technology agnostic so that it can adapt to uh, the changes in technology and clinical application. I wanted to finish by giving some quick examples of exciting projects that we're doing and, and somewhat reminiscent of some of the, the work that, that Mike and Laura have alluded to. One concept is to take the, the, the underpinnings of scientific wellness and apply them to cancer survivorship. That's a logical thing to do. So uh, we're in the process of completing uh, the protocol. It'll be submitted to the IRB this month of April. And basically we wanted to do an exploratory uh, trial, if you will, uh, looking at 
biologic profiling before and after treatment for early stage breast cancer, and then trying to find biological handles, correlates, um, with uh, treatment-related sequelae, whether it's neurocognitive disorder, also known as chemobrain, or peripheral neuropathy, or weight fluctuations, fatigue. And once those uh, biological handles are identified, once those biomarkers are identified, then we have the ability to attempt to either ameliorate or prevent uh, these uh, sequelae from treatment, and in some cases, sequelae from uh, disease. I'm going to skip over these slides. They'll be available to you. I also want to emphasize that even with a small data set, we have almost 1,000 patients, there is a lot of information to be gleaned. This was uh, a poster that my colleague, Dr. Tara Benkers, presented at ASCO a year ago, which is, to our knowledge, the largest discipline molecular phenotyping of patients with primary brain tumors. And we were able to characterize that group of patients in a way that we feel will be helpful in driving our clinical research strategies. This is another uh, really nifty little paper that um, Chuck Drescher and Anna Berry uh, led. And what we wanted to do, we realized that uh, P53 uh, uh, tumor suppressor mutations are, are very common. But in some instances, there's evidence from the literature, from the laboratory, that some of these are gain-of-function mutations. Uh, gain-of-function mutations. So uh, in that setting, um, we investigated our group of P53 mutations and identified that 10% of our patients had these gain-of-function mutations. And for reasons that we don't quite understand yet, uh, they generally weren't found in our small experience in breast cancer patients but we're found in other disease types, and there's even some more detail in terms of the specific alterations. And uh, lastly, uh, this is a, a paper that I was just presenting at ACR on Sunday, uh, two days ago, and uh, this looks at, okay, what is the impact of this genomic profiling on the clinic? How does the clinician use this information? So we interrogated our database to give you some idea of 906 patients. Uh, effectively, 87% had some gene alteration. Uh, of those 87%, about three quarters had actionable or applicable gene alterations. Actionable means on-label. Applicable means either off-label or relevant to an active clinical trial. Uh, these are the common mutations, KRAS, EGFR, PIK3CA, BRAF were the common actionable mutations. For those in the field, these are not surprising. And then again, as shown here, uh, applicable mutations included P53, TPMT, uh, PIK3CA, and uh, thymidyl synthase, synthase uh, gene. Now, this is the core of the slide. Only 20% of physicians felt that the molecular profiling had a clinical impact for their patient. And we break that down into what exactly that meant. And for the vast majority of patients where there was no clinical impact, it was generally due to insufficient evidence or the lack of access to drugs or clinical trials. And I've just told you the conclusions, so we'll skip through those. I want to finish with, uh, and again, I was talking to Mike before our presentations, and it's uh, somewhat uncanny that I'm going to present you one of the early efforts, um, especially amongst the not-for-profit uh, hospitals and systems to collaborate across traditional lines. So this project was recognized by Vice President Biden's Moonshot Initiative. Why? Because it attempts to reach large ends by sharing of de-identified data. And uh, this really began with a group of three systems and uh, health institutions that were commonly using SIAPS, the IT platform that I referenced. And uh, Jim Ford at uh, Stanford, one of the Mike's colleagues, uh, myself and Lincoln Adult at Intermountain Health felt that this was uh, a good place to start because we shared IT platforms, we had the same vision for sharing de-identified data. And again, uh, the purpose of uh, this 
effort, Open Oncology Precision Network. Everyone spends many hours trying to figure out clever acronyms. I think we did okay. Uh, the founding members are the three institutions I've referenced uh, to include not only the Swedish Cancer Institute, but Providence St. Joseph Health as a system. And we want to create a big data resource for clinical care and research using de-identified data. The kind of data that we're sharing is very simple at this point. The generic variants, the tumor types, tumor stage, histology, you notice there aren't that many data elements. The most important actually relate to clinical outcomes. And without going into detail, that's the most complex information to gather. So at present, this nascent group uh, includes um, effectively 190 hospitals covering 22 states. And um, we hope to, to grow this over time. The basic challenge, of course, uh, these projects are much more complicated than they seem. You have a collection of interface systems, whether it's the PAC system often used for radiologic data, the electronic medical record, computerized physician order entry, the data warehouse that I alluded to, the laboratory information system, tumor registries. Uh, these all are inputs, not to mention those from the sequencing labs or any outsourced materials. So we need uh, a common language uh, to communicate. Uh, probably the important aspect of this slide, again, it seems mundane, but is anything but. One has to use standard ontogeny, st standard uh, nomenclature, uh, so that we, we know what we're managing in terms of the data. And this, of course, for the uh, molecular biologist and the geneticist in the room, this applies especially to the way we label gene alterations. Uh, the other point in this system is each institution owns its own data. Uh, the, the composite data is jointly uh, controlled, and there's a, uh, an entire governance approach to how the information is used. Again, this is all de-identified data, and it is HIPAA compliant. And again, you saw the screenshot before, but it's a similar uh, SIAPS platform that will allow us to interrogate this database based on common uh, clinical characteristics, uh, prior treatments, uh, the gene alterations, of course, and uh, any combination thereof to include uh, the associated outcomes. Uh, we have a growing list of significant not-for-profit health systems that are wanting to join in our efforts, and uh, we are also rolling this out within our own Providen Providence St. Joseph Health uh, system, so that we anticipate within the next several years that we'll be uh, effectively collecting data on over 130,000 new uh, cancer patients each year, for almost 600 oncologists spanning 240 hospitals. Now, you might say, how does this relate to projects? I was just at AACR and heard a very lovely presentation about Genie, the AACR-sponsored uh, similar platform, and I believe SAGE is engaged in, in that effort. It's a beautiful project, and I, I do not see these as mutually exclusive. In fact, uh, we, we hope to participate in uh, Genie as well. So, um, again, the purpose of this is to effectively inform day-to-day -day clinical management, but also to serve for data mining research purposes. The very last slide is an example of what I would aspire to do for our drug development program here at the Swedish Cancer Institute. And Lee and I have talked about this uh, on multiple occasions. It's not uncommon nowadays for physicians when they want to identify not just the therapy of last resort, but the appropriate phase one therapy to use some degree of biologic profiling. What we would like to do at the SCI and with ISB's support and those of other collaborators is to effectively routinely use biologic profiling in a fairly broad sense over a brief period of time to help assign patients to early phase treatments, but to do this routinely. And although many of us are doing this to some degree, it's not being done routinely in this uh, population uh, where new phase or early phase new uh, therapies are, are critical in terms of uh, their chances of benefit. So with that, um, you know, the challenges in this field are, are many. Uh, what I want to point out, uh, you can read the list,
but the most important, I assembled these in ascending order. The expansion of the physician's comfort zone, from my perspective and that of many of my colleagues, is the greatest challenge. Uh, and I think that most of the folks in this room understand that comment. We can maybe talk about it a little uh, during the discussion. I want to uh, recognize our excellent uh, personalized medicine research program team at the SCI, as well as my colleagues across uh, Providence St. Joseph Health. Thank you. <laughs>